Hello everybody and welcome back. So in this next lesson we're going to be talking about strings. Now strings are basically just text. Okay, It's a data type that we've discussed already uh, and as I've mentioned before strings are essentially arrays but this is what makes them so powerful and so flexible is the fact that they kind of have these array functions that can work with them plus their own functions and really you know because of their nature we can store a lot of information using strings also things like navigating folder structures choosing where to save scenes or creating um, you know folders to store um, files in writing files for those folders all of this requires a lot of work with strings because essentially you know file paths are strings so you're going to need to work with it a lot even within Houdini you know just because we're working with a lot of you know geometry or simulations doesn't mean that we're not also wanting to cache these things out and this is where strings come in handy as well as things like name attributes and you know basically it's very very powerful and very very common to use strings all the time so knowing how to work with them is imperative okay so let's just start with a few basics that we've already sort of been been using and let's just just touch on that so um, although you've seen me use it a few times uh, I should probably mention properly that the print function in Python what it's really doing is printing a string of whatever we feed it now we can print strings themselves so uh, this is a string there we are so I can say print and then give it a string and then it will print that string okay but we can also print things that are not strings so a float for example but the fact is it's printing it as a string okay so it's essentially returning a string from this but then printing it to the terminal all right so printing is something that we're going to use quite a lot um, and although you know it doesn't necessarily fall under the strings category I thought I should mention it here um, and basically we're going to mostly be using printing for testing things generally you want to you know when you're setting any kind of variable or as you're building up your your script you're going to want to um, at a certain stopping point you test whether you know that attribute is actually being generated correctly before moving on so you print to the terminal so that you get data out of the script it's essentially the script talking back to you giving you information at a certain key point as well as well, in addition to that we're also going to be printing to report back things to the actual user so not just us while we're scripting but in general we need to inform the user of things we are going to use print okay so let, that's just that's just printing which is a little bit of an aside but it kind of relates to strings so I thought I would mention it here now let's talk about creating strings and and a little bit more complex strings than we have been doing up till now where we're just writing you know a few little uh, words so I'm going to use the Python source editor for this and we're going to create a variable called my string uh, but we're going to print my string okay so uh, over here I can just go and give it um, you know some text right so this will result in us just printing that to the terminal okay pretty self-explanatory now there are a few special characters that we can include in our strings that do things above and beyond just normal characters right so one of them is creating a new line you'll see here that this is a single line of text okay and even if I keep typing I could type a whole lot of text and it's still going to only be a single line sure if we print it when the terminal is small enough some terminals like depending okay this one seems to just uh, just disappear under here but I think with the other terminal that normally pops up with Houdini I think that does wrap but text wrapping is not quite the same as having a new line of text so it is an important distinction and it's good to know uh, 
how to create a new line here instead of having everything in one line. Okay, so let's actually insert one over here. So after the word sum. So the backslash key is mostly going to be used for special characters or, or certain certain special functions. So you'll see that it's it's kind of our our key character that's going to do special things. So I'm just going to show you the, the new line and tabbing and then also escaping, but there are other things that you can do with it as well. So to create a new line, you just put backslash n. Okay. So now when I print this, you see it prints the word sum and then it's a new line. It has a space still, which is why that seems to be tabbed in there by one space and then text. Okay. So there will also be an empty um, space at the end of the word sum. Okay. So even though you can't see it here, really, those are actually correctly printing the all of these characters, including this is a new line character. Okay. Now, if we wanted to also tab something in, we can put backslash T. Okay. And if we don't want any spaces, then we would put it like this. So I know this can look a little confusing sometimes when you look at this, it's hard to decipher what's happening. But backslash T is going to put a tab. And then because we don't want an additional space after the tab before we have our text, we need to have it all squashed up against it, right? Plus, normally you wouldn't have an empty space at the end of a line so you should compress all of that right and now when we print this it prints the word sum then it goes to a new line tabs in and then prints the rest of it okay now you need to be very careful obviously here we have the an actual t in the word text so if for some reason we just went and inserted a, a slash over here uh, we would not get the um, you know expected result. It's not going to print the, the letter T at all because it assumes that the T is part of this, which is a character saying tab. So it thinks that we're wanting to tab in and then type the word EXT. So you need to be very, very careful of this. This is also why we need to be careful when uh, doing any file paths that we don't have backslashes like this. Um, so we have to use either raw text or, well, anyway, basically I'll, I'll get there. I'll get to how we can work with these backslashes. But the main point I'm trying to make is you need to be very careful with slashes in uh, strings. And while we're on the topic of being careful of things, we also need to be careful of quotes because the quote is what determines the fact that this is a string. Okay. Now, what if I want to, you know, use a word like um, can't, okay, which has a, an apostrophe, right? Now, this has essentially gone, started a string, it's typed all of this, and then over here, it thinks that I'm ending the string. So now it has some random floating text, which it doesn't know really what that is. And then this final quote is the start of a new string, which we don't ever actually end. So this is obviously an absolute disaster. If, if I hit apply now, it's just gonna error. I mean, it's got like three or four different errors here for some reason. It doesn't know what these are. It's got a string that is multi-line but doesn't have, a, um, have an end. There's lots wrong with this, okay? But what we can do is use the backslash to escape certain special characters, okay? So, any character that is considered to be special, like the actual quote, single quote, we can use a backslash to say, don't think of this as special, just keep this as a literal um, character. Okay. And now when we print, it'll actually print that apostrophe as a literal string uh, character. Right. Now, that's not something else we can do now is what if we actually wanted a slash? So what if this was some kind of file path or whatever, and depending on your operating system, you might have a backslash, okay? Now, if we do this, right, that will work because there's an S in front of it, and in the backslash S is not anything special. But the second there's anything, like a T or an N or any of the other special characters, it's gonna assume that that's what we mean, okay? So we need to be very careful of that and say, no, 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 hang on. This slash, what I want is for it to just be a slash. This is not 
uh, backslash T saying, okay, uh, create a tab. Uh, so we just put another slash because this backslash is saying ignore the specialness of this one. Okay. And now you'll see that it doesn't print two slashes because the first one is still special. The first one is an escape saying that this one is normal. And then obviously because this one's normal, it doesn't take away the T because the T is just part of the text and is not part of the tab. Uh, special function okay so with two slashes we just get one slash in here which again is something that we need to be careful of because maybe that's what we expect but maybe it's not maybe we genuinely want two slashes and then we would have to go and go actually put in sorry four slashes to get two because really what we're saying is this one is saying that this one is normal and then this one saying that this one's normal and so we end up with two and yeah so it can it can look a little bit confusing um, when working with strings especially when you're trying to use real characters well like special characters as real literals so so just just be careful that's all i'm saying now there is something as well that we can do is in front of a string we can put an r which turns this into raw text Okay, now when we print this, what you're going to see is that it prints everything inside of there as though none of it is special. Okay, it ignores our slash n, it ignores our slash t, it even ignores the backslash that turns the apostrophe, like basically into an actual apostrophe instead of being one of the quotes. Okay, so this is one way of handling strings which have a whole bunch of special characters in that you don't want to go in and um, escape but then obviously you can't have any special characters in there so you can't have tabs and new lines if later on you then want to ignore all the rest of the special characters so if you want you can go through and create a raw string but then you need to be really careful with the special characters and obviously see in this case it still doesn't work because you need you need to cancel out this um, single quote but then it's still going to print it with that with that slash okay so there are a few limitations all right um, so something else that we cannot do just in a normal uh, normal line of text right so let me let me take let me take this away and we'll take away any of our sort of special things and just talk about some normal normal letters for now but what if I wanted to actually type multiple lines and not only because of the way that it prints but also because sometimes when we're working with these scripts like it's very difficult if I just had to keep typing here I mean you don't want to have to deal with this giant one line huge string like this and then have to go and scroll backwards and forwards trying to figure it all out okay so we just want to actually you know basically type this in multiple lines and print it in multiple lines so that it's actually easier to manage, right? So we wanna do multiple lines like this, okay? Now, when I try and print this, it's going to complain, okay? And this is because single quotes and double quotes, they do not support multi-line strings, right? But triple quotes allows us to type a multi-line string. And there's a few things special about that. So uh, let's let's do it and I'll show you. So here we go, I've put three single quotes. Alternatively, I could also put three double quotes, right? So like that, I could put three double quotes. As long as the start and end have the same thing, then it will work, okay? So let me print this and let's see what's happened. So here we have now multiple lines of text, which is great. And that relates exactly to what we're doing over here. But one of the things that you'll see is that it's taking these tabs over here as actual tabs, right? So it is reading those tabs quite literally from, from this text, okay? Us wanting to tab in just because we're typing as part of the string is actually adding tabbing into this, which is not quite what we want, right? 
And just know that also any new lines are being counted as new lines here. So yeah, that may be what you want, but also just make sure that it is what you want. You cannot just go and type a multi-line text uh, like string like this, but expect it to print it in one line, okay? Uh, there are ways to then convert this multi-line text into a single line, but you know, this, this is going to print this way unless you convert it basically. Okay, so another way of typing multi-line strings, but with a little bit more uh, control. In other words, we can control typing multiple lines in our code, but still print it as single line or multi-line in our, in our code, well, when we print to the terminal, is by using a backslash outside of a quote. So let me show you what I mean. So let's say we wanna type uh, some, some text over here. And then what we wanna do is just go to a new line and continue to type some stuff, okay? But we want this to actually appear as one line. We just wanna split it up into multiple lines because it's easier in the code to actually type it, right? And in fact, you'll see later on there is a certain um, character limit of how many lines you can type uh, for it to be considered good practice. It's not that you cannot type a very long single line, but even PyCharm, uh, the, which is a program that we're gonna use later on to help with our um, scripting, uh, with external um, scripts, it, it will complain and kind of try to uh, limit you as to the number of characters you can have before it wants you to move to the next line. Mostly that is just for the sake of the people reading the code. If someone's gonna edit your code or work with it, including yourself later on, you don't want everything printed in one line, like just you know, a giant long function that's just got a million arguments all taking up one line and going off the screen and having to scroll over to see what's happening. It's very confusing, okay? So what we can do here is actually finish this line with a with a single quote. So we, we're essentially having one string here. And then what we do is we, ha we put a backslash, okay? And now this backslash is essentially saying, you should go to the next line and continue looking for the rest of this string, okay? And then we can do the exact same thing over here. We can put a slash and then type uh, put another quote. So now we have literally three separate strings that are be that are being joined like this. And now when I print, you see it prints it as a single line, but we have had the, the choice of printing it in multiple lines, okay? And this also reads the, our special characters that we mentioned before. So if I do want a new line here at the end of of this line of text, Rather than being forced to have it like we would with the multi-line text, uh, you know, with the one with the triple quotes, instead I have the option now of inserting it, okay? So I can put a, a slash in, and then it will push it to a new line, okay? Or over here, I could put a slash T and push that by one tab. So now if I print, it prints some text on one line, and then it continues to type on the next line, and then it tabs in and then put some stuff. Okay, and then same rules apply, obviously, if you're wanting to um, cancel this, then you'd put two slashes, so then that would actually be a single slash and a T, you know, so same rules as before. Right, so this is very useful sometimes. We will actually use this quite often. In fact, PyCharm does this for you automatically. If you start typing a really long line of text, if you are inside of text and hit enter, it will add the slash automatically for you and move this to the next line. And if ever I'm typing multiple lines of code, uh, well, as, as a string, I generally like to do it uh, this way, where I actually, for every time I put a new line, I actually put it as a new line in here, because then it becomes very quick and easy to see what your text is gonna look like. At the end of every line is a return, so new line, and then you tab in on whichever lines you need to tab in, okay? And then that way, it very clearly from this, this kind of relates to what's appearing here. 
Now, I just want to point out as well that something, another use for your uh, multi-line strings, the triple quote ones that we used before, is the fact that those are accepted just sort of floating around in your code, okay? So you can't just put normal um, strings just floating around with not assigned to a variable, but these multi-line strings can be, they can be used as essentially kind of like multi-line comments, right? So you can put triple quotes and then uh, put, you know, a reminder to yourself, uh, you know, I mean, not, not your actual shopping reminder, but you know, something that you would like to do later on in the code or something like that. And you can just kind of leave that there. So it's not assigned to a variable. It's actually just there for you. And now, you know, you can continue to print and do whatever. This is not actually having any effect on your code, but it's just sitting there as a, as a random string. Now you can type little notes to yourself or, you know, build a whole section. I mean, especially here, because it's multi-line string, you can literally actually, you know, type whole sections like this. You could, you could kind of, as long as it's between triple quotes, you could then actually build a whole list of stuff and you could type things, leave notes for yourself, do whatever, um, you know, tab in. And this will then get entirely ignored. Okay. And in fact, this kind of mimics, it's very similar to the, then the formatting that we use to create help files for your actual functions. So when you do write a function, you can actually also write a little help file. So when someone's trying to run your function, like here, when we've got a, a string or something, or let, let me just say, um, if I initialize a dictionary and then I type dot, you'll see all of these functions. And then when I start typing one, it's got a, an actual help file here. Well, that will come from us typing a line sort of similar to this in a, in a multi-line uh, string. So we'll probably use that later on to um, add some help files to our own um, functions and modules that we create. Okay, so let's move on. Now, I have mentioned before that strings are basically arrays. Okay, but I want to go further, like a little bit more in depth into that and actually show you exactly how they're similar and how we can use some array functions to work with these strings. So one of the main things is our indexing. In other words, we can, we can kind of slice a string the same way we would with an array. So if I just go and put the word, um, you know, the character five in here, what I'm saying is go grab the fifth index of this string. Now this will obviously be zero, one, two, three, four, five. So five would be this T, okay? And when I print, it's gonna give me the letter T, okay? So you can go and grab individual parts of a string using this, okay? Um, obviously with just, you know, giant bodies of text, that's probably not the most useful thing, but sometimes your string is actually, you've stored a whole bunch of data in one long string and actually the, the fifth character is a very specific one, okay? Uh, slicing as well. So not just single characters, but also we could say from three to 10, and then it will return exactly that. So E space T E X T. Okay. And it's, it's going to return that. And we can do the same thing that we did before, where we say, if we leave that out, this says from three to the end. So it does that. Or we can say from the beginning up until uh, before number 10, and then it will give us that. Okay, so we can slice strings the same way we can slice arrays. Something else we can do is grab the length of a string. So that's something we can do with arrays. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned it before, but basically there's a, there's a function called len, and len lets us grab the length of an array. In other words, how many characters are there, or how many items are there in that array? So if it's a dictionary, how many keys are there? If it's a string, how many characters are there? If it's a list, how many items or indices do we have in that list? Okay, so this is not a function that runs, it's not a, a class function, okay? So it doesn't run, we don't go dot len, okay? There is no string dot len, same as there is no array dot len, right? 
this is an actual function, a global function, um, which is part of the Python module. So when we, we, we just run it, because we've obviously, you know, we're in Python, so we don't need to import a Python module. This is just a standard um, function that ships with Python. We say len, and then we give it our string and or our array, whatever it is, and it will tell us the length of that array. Okay, so in this case, it's saying we have 38 characters, right? And the same thing if we had any sort of um, list or whatever. So my list equals those things, then we could say here the length of my list and it will tell us that there are three things in that list. Okay, so length is very useful. Now, let's move on to count, okay? So the same, same function that we've applied before to arrays where we were counting how many times something appears in the list, so like this. So three appears three times in this list. Well, we can do the same thing to strings so we can say dot count so now this is an actual um, like uh, class function that is specific to this data type so because we're running it on a string it goes dot count okay and then we feed it this uh, uh, whichever character we want to go and check so let's let's say t okay now remember it has to obviously be um, a string because that's a character that we're wanting to search for. If we just fed it T, T would be a variable name, which we don't have anything very initialized as T, so it would error. And if we did have it, it would insert that in here and then go search for that as a string in here. Okay, so the, the result is six. So we can go see that we have one, two, three, four, five, and six. T's. Now, do you see that it did not count this one? Okay, otherwise it would have said seven. It's not counting the string literally. When it when we take our string over here and then run any functions on it, this T is part of this tab function. So it's not a T, right? It's not going to count towards this count. Okay. However, obviously, if we went and made this literal, then it would. Okay. Well, sorry, we have to. We have to go in there and make this all uh, literal, and then it would say seven, okay? Because now this doesn't count as a tab, so there's just a random backslash t in there, and now there's seven t's, okay? So that's count, uh, which is in common with arrays, and then also we have index, okay? So in other words, we we feed it which. Uh, value we're looking for and it tells us which index it's sitting at it'll it'll basically return the first instance of that character so when I give it t what it's saying is 0 1 2 3 4 5 at the fifth index over here it's printed 5 at the fifth index is the first instance of the letter t so this is the same as working with uh, arrays but we can also do something here, uh, something I should have shown before, which is you can do r index, which essentially is basically saying do the index function, but read it from the right, as in read it from the back end and work backwards. So now it's going to return the last index of, well, the last instance of the t. Okay. So there it is, 34. And since we have 38 characters, we know that you know that's 34 35 36 37 right so it's telling us that we have 38 characters in total okay so that's the location of the very last t okay okay so those are some of the functions that are primarily sort of in common between strings and arrays uh, but there are a few other functions that are more specific to strings, stuff that we can only do to a string because we know that what we're dealing with inside of that string is actual characters, as opposed to in arrays, what we're dealing with is a bunch of objects. Now those could be different varying and mixed data types, so we're limited in what functionality we can apply. So one of the main things that we would do when we have a string. Let me actually create a little bit of a simpler string over here just for the next few examples. So I'm going to put some spaces in here and then um, insert some 
text here, okay? And we'll get rid of our list for now. So let's print our string and there we have it. Um, in fact, there we go, it's printed it over there. All right, uh, you see if I just click in here and enter, then when I print, it's gonna print to this terminal instead. Okay, so something that we often want to do is to strip out any white spaces. Now this is because a lot of the time the strings that you get are gonna be actually grabbed from somewhere else, whether you know it's some kind of error message or whether it's from something that the user um, typed in. Now you don't know if the user is gonna start every line with a space or maybe they were typing and at the end of the sentence they typed the space thinking they were gonna type more and then didn't and then just hits enter. Now you get the string that has a leading, um, sorry, like a, a trailing uh, empty space. So a lot of the time with strings, we have to clean them up. We have to be very careful about what we accept, especially from users or from other uh, sort of areas where we might not be able to control it. For example, errors in Houdini, if we could grab those errors as text and analyze them, that might be fine, but what if someone even literally at side effects goes and puts an accidental space at the end of the error because they come up, you know, they create some new error or the new version, somebody has to just retype it and they accidentally leave in a space, okay? If we're not in control of exactly what characters are in that text, then it's better to have a way to clean it up, okay? So we need to use the strip function. Okay, so what strip does is it pulls out any of the leading and trailing white space. Okay, so when I print this, you'll see now it prints it with no white space in the beginning and end. Now it only strips from the beginning and end, it will not strip it out from the, from the middle, so it's, it's only there. Now, if you give it no arguments, it assumes that what you're wanting to strip out is white space, but you could sometimes have underscores, okay, or other characters, whatever it is, maybe you've got, uh, you know, um, stars or something like that. It, it could be anything, right? Uh, I guess it depends on where you're getting it from or what sort of program, you, you know, you're grabbing it from. Because uh, some things don't allow spaces, they replace all spaces with underscores. So if there are leading white spaces, it'll swap it with underscores. And then when you receive it, you need to strip out underscores, not white space. So for whatever reason, you can insert a different character in here and then it will strip those out, okay? So you'll see here, <clears throat> this has stripped out the underscores from this, but it has not stripped out the star. You could also go and swap that for the star and then it'll strip those out, but not the underscores, right? So sometimes you could possibly need to apply this multiple times. So you'd do something like that if you wanted to strip it all out, if you knew that those were very specifically gonna be on the front and end, okay? Okay, so that's strip. Uh, also, just wanna point out that there is also an uh, L strip which strips only the left, so even if they are the same, uh, let's go and put in two spaces again. So you just wanna strip white space, but it'll only strip from the beginning, not the end. Okay, so you'll see here there are actually characters, whereas here there are not. Okay, I know it's hard to see, but if I select, you can see there's actually white space. Or there's an R strip, which strips only the end and not the beginning. So now we have white space there, but nothing at the end. Okay, and same thing, you can give it a special character if it's not just a white space. Okay, so now there's a few things we can do in terms of cases because obviously what we're receiving here with text is actual, um, you know, it's, it's words, okay? I mean, not always. Some, sometimes our text is just garbled, you know, it's, it's data or information, you know, a list of individual um, strings that relate to something. But um, most of the time, the string actually means something, you know, it's actual text. And so sometimes what we want to do is print that in some useful way. Or if a person has typed it and we want to clean it up, how do you know if they've typed with capital letters or not? Maybe they've left the caps key on. Then, you know, how, how do you know? So it's better to control these things. So there's a few functions that I'm going to show you here. So one of them is lower. So if we print lower, obviously we won't see any difference because everything's 
all typed in lowers. But if I go and enter a few capital letters over here, you'll see that lower will still print everything in lowercase. Whereas if I just print the string normally, it then has a few random capital letters. Okay, uh, we can also use upper to make everything capitalized. So we can shout at people on YouTube or something. And uh, then we can capitalize as well. Now, please note, uh, this is the American spelling of capitalize because like I said, all of the functions, all of this is uh, designed uh, by American companies. So uh, the Z, it's a Z, not an S, just in case anyone else in like the UK or whatever is, is confused by that. Um, so that capitalizes the first letter as though it's a sentence. So first letter is capital, the rest are lower. Okay. So, but it actually makes them lower. It doesn't just capitalize the first one and ignore the rest. You'll see here that it has left the, the S E R and the T over here as lowercase. Okay. And then we have title, which turns it into title case, which is essentially um, that you capitalize the first letter of every word. So it's not like a sentence, it's more like an actual title. Okay, so there we have it. Uh, then some other useful functions we might have over here is the um, starts with and ends with uh, functions. So these are pretty cool. Obviously, okay, so later on, we're going to be talking a lot about um, regular expressions, which are very, very powerful um, sort of method of, of looking through strings and assessing the different characters in there, but with, with very, very powerful and dynamic rules. Um, but sometimes you just need something really, really simple. You know, like you just want to check whether somebody's given you a, a path, like a full path, or or not. So, like, if, for example, in your Houdini, your Houdini scene, um, sometimes if you receive, you get a, a path to a node. If it starts with dot dot slash, you know, or any sort of iteration of dot dot slash dot dot slash whatever, or even just dot slash, so up one level or whatever. That shows you that it's a relative path as opposed to something starting with slash obj, okay? So what you can do, so let's actually go and insert that over here. If, if let's say we had a path to a node like this, okay? And then we wanted to assess that and figure out whether that was a relative path or whether it was, um, uh, what's the opposite of relative path? Oh, wow. Uh, can't remember right now, but anyway, a relative path or just a, an explicit path. Okay. So then we would say, does it start, starts with, and then we would give it just sort of a, you know, even just dot. Because it doesn't matter if it's dot slash or dot dot slash, we know that that is then relative. If it's non-relative, it will start with a slash or with some other character. Okay. So if it starts with a dot, then we can do something about it. So starts with is gonna return a Boolean. So it's assessing the string, but it's gonna return a Boolean based on what we've given it, okay? So when we print this, it says true, okay? So we would use this as a Boolean to say, well, if this is true, then convert this from a relative path to an explicit path, okay? Whereas if it does not, then we don't have to do that conversion, okay? That's why we would use this Boolean as part of an if statement. There is also the ends with statement, which often you would use for something like if you have uh, some kind of, you know, my cash sim dot dollar f three dot bgo. Okay. And maybe you want to check um, how, like, maybe you want to do a bunch of different methods depending on the file format. So then you'd say, does it end with dot bgo dot sc? Okay, if so, then you do something, and then if it ends with .bdb, you do something else. So see, that's true. So yeah, we would we'd probably type something like, if this ends with .bgo.sc, then, um, you know, just do do something to relate that relates to uh, .bgo.sc. So depending on whatever you would want, you'd replace this 
with a block and then you'd go l if my string dot ends with dot vdb okay so then that's one of your options as well so then you'd do something to that and then maybe at the end then you'd say otherwise if it's none of those file formats then uh, do something else okay now obviously these three passes would just be replaced with a whole block of um, text whatever code it is that you want to apply to your uh, bgo.sc versus your vdb and then all other file formats okay all right so that is starts and ends with and you can also uh, search your string so you can basically do a find function now the find function uh, is basically exactly the same as the um, as indexing so so if you just go find the letter um, well we've got a new one here so find the letter s then it's going to return it's going to tell you what um, index that is at so eight it's because your S is here at the eighth index. Okay. Uh, and you can also do an R find. So then that will be um, find from the end. So it'll go backwards from the end and tell you when the last S is, which I think there's only one S. So it's actually pointing to the same thing. So it's 21 from the end. Oh, no, no. Sorry. Yeah, it's 21 is there. So it is counting from the beginning, but it starts searching from the back. So the 21th, 21st. Um, index is an S and also the eighth one is okay now something else we have is replace so for example in this exact case what if we wanted to go and actually convert the um, dollar dot dollar f3 with something else you know like uh, just some kind of stand in variable or actually replace it with the frame number or something like that. So we would say go replace and then we feed it first the text that it should search for and you can give it multiple characters so that it will only uh, only when it finds all three of those characters will it replace it. Okay. So if somewhere else you had the characters F3 it wouldn't replace it. Right. And then you give it what you want to replace that with, um, you know, so you can actually do, um, I believe it's who.frame, okay? So then, well, actually, I think it's a function, so we have to do it like this. And so, um, sorry, let me just replace that. Okay, no, sorry, I can't quite remember how that who.frame works, but um, anyway, let's just say we want to replace it with something, like we'll go and actually find our frame number, okay? Then now we search and actually swap it for that. All right. So we could even convert. So dot bgo dot sc we can go and replace with dot uh, vdb. And now we can actually say so force the person's cache to actually be writing out a vdb, even though they've specified dot bgo dot sc. Okay. All right. Now. Something else very interesting that we can do with strings, uh, which we often need to do, especially when working with um, with file paths, uh, is to split them. So what splitting does is it basically, we feed it a character, and what it's gonna do is use that character as a thing to, um, to define where to break up this string into multiple separate strings that are all then um, built into a, an array. So just a long list of these separate individual strings separated by that character. So for example, if I wanted to go, let's go back to, um, let me type a full sentence here. Okay, so if I just said, if I just print my string dot split, and it has the same thing with the um, strip where if you give it nothing, it assumes what you mean is white space. Now, when I print this, you'll see what it has done is it's found the word let, and then it's found a white space because that's the default of this. So it's found a white space, and so it decides, I'm gonna now split this here. I'm gonna take these three characters, put them as, the f as one string, 
as the first index in this list. And then I'm gonna start reading from here onwards and then it finds another one and it takes it. So it extracts each word and drops these spaces, okay? So same thing if you had a file path with a whole bunch of backslashes and you wanted a, a way to essentially have a list of the hierarchy of where this file is stored, okay? You would then be, a, say, split, but you'd split by the actual divider instead, right? And so you'd end up with this list where all of these are now the folder names, okay? Except for the last one, which would be your uh, dot, uh, you know, dot VDB or whatever it is, your actual file extension, okay? So then you'd be able to say, you'd maybe store this in my uh, list, so or my path equals that, right? And now you could say, well, my file name equals my path, but the negative one index. So in other words, the very last index of that list is the file name, okay? So then we would do that, and obviously we print file name to see what we've extracted and there we go we've been able to extract here dot vdb from this long list okay and maybe we want to even separate the extension from that so then we would say you know uh, maybe we would say we can do a find for example so we say search this for the first instance of a dot okay and what that's going to return is four so for what it's saying is within here, the fourth index is actually, you know, fr from that point onwards is where that dot is. So that's our extension, but we want everything up until that. Okay, so because we want to extract just the file name. Okay, so what we would do actually is we'd, sorry, we, we're gonna, we've got our, our full file name over here. We would then create a separate um, variable for our actual, just like our, just our file name, just the name itself, which we would reference the full file name, right? So it, it's, we're grabbing the result from here, but we're then using this dot find, so that's the fourth index. So this whole line, everything I have selected is gonna return the number four. What we want to do though is grab our full file name but put four as the index to grab from, right? But we want to grab from the beginning and up until four. So we actually go like blank, colon, and then the number four, okay? And then when we print file name, you'll see here that it just prints the word here. And we could do the exact same thing for the extension, right? So we would say uh, extension equals, now we would take our full file name, which is this, okay? So it's that, we take our full file name, we find where that dot is, but instead of selecting from the beginning up until the fourth index, we select from the fourth index until the end. So we just move our colon to the end over there. And then if we print uh, extension, we would now print .vdb. So we've been able to separate our file name and our extension, okay? Alternatively, a totally different way of doing this would be to split. So we would then take our full file name .split and we'd feed it the dot as a way of splitting it. Now, when we do this, this is gonna return another list, okay? Which is a, um, the, basically our file name and our extension. Note that it has dropped the dot though, the dot VDB. So if we want to keep this with the dot, we will have to add that back in. But we now have our file name and extension. So if we split like this and take the first index, which is zero, that would be our file name. So we would say file name equals and that, and then uh, extension equals full file name dot split, but then we take the last index, which is negative one, 
All right. And so we can print file name and print ext and it'll print both of those here and vdb all right okay so there's a, there's a couple of ways of just kind of combining everything we've learned and to show you how to work with these uh, with these strings all right so i'm going to move on now to we're going to talk about formatting and this is quite a quite an advanced uh, bit so but we're going to use this quite a lot so try to follow along i'm going to just uh, I'll be back in a minute. I'm just going to reset this whole thing and uh, so we can start with a nice blank scene because this is a very, very important part that we're going to use many, many times in the future and you will always use it when coding. So this is definitely something to pay attention. <laughs> 